Hi guys, in this video we're going to introduce association rules used for market basket analysis. So first let's talk a little bit about what association rules as a kind of family is. It's an unsupervised learning technique which means there's no target for us uh, either to kind of shoot for. Um, it's strictly searching the data for interesting patterns in the form of association rules which we'll discuss more as we get closer to um, getting them uh, so it's unsupervised there's no target feature and uh, when applied to market basket analysis we're dealing with a um, transactional data oftentimes okay so this is often used to get product to give product recommendations uh, whether in an online store or in a physical uh, retail location um, to suggest items to to uh, customers who have bought other items um, either at the point of checkout or at the uh, by placing things close to things that are associated close to each other on the shelves in a physical store, uh, it's also used for music recommendation systems, um, and it has far-reaching applications in beyond transactional data. But market basket analysis tends to use it for product recommendations, content opt optimization um, on websites where to place advertisements, where to uh, place articles, uh, and um, content in general. Um, so it has, it has far-reaching applications. Um, what we're going to do is take a real traditional example uh, and, and apply association rules uh, to market basket analysis in a grocery store. So this, this data set is uh, quite popular among um, data scientists. It's used to illustrate uh, these techniques and other techniques as well, uh, machine learning, statistical learning techniques. Um, let me give you a little um, taste of what the data looks like in its raw form. So it's transactional data, so you can uh, you can think of this, you can easily relate to this, it's not complicated. We, we're looking at a grocery store, and uh, let me see, I don't, I don't think I can zoom this in, but we're at a grocery store, and obviously the transactions represent each individual purchase made at that grocery store. Now a grocery store may have hundreds of items, okay? in the store. Some people will buy one item, some people will buy many items. So a transaction can have anywhere from one item to many items. And so you can imagine there's a lot of possibilities of different kinds of transactions, even at, the, at a, a grocery store. So we're looking at, uh, the, or, the data here is organized in um, rows of this, uh, of these, uh, the, the data you're looking at here represent tra individual transactions. So what I'm highlighting here is the first transaction in the data. So uh, each item is separated by a comma. So we see that this first person purchased citrus fruit, semi-finished bread. I guess that means you put that in the oven yourself to kind of when you're gonna when you want to eat it margarine and ready soups okay so here she purchased four items okay the next person or next transaction has a new row okay so tropical fruit yogurt and coffee next person just bought whole milk okay so there's just whole milk on that line on that row and so on. And I think we have upwards of 9,000 transactions here, which might seem like a lot, but actually transactional data can get much, much, much bigger than this as far as number of examples, the number of rows. Uh, because you could just imagine a, an online retailer like Amazon would have this many transactions in an hour maybe, if, let alone if you would track, would, would compile the transactions over um, months, if not.
a longer periods than that. You could be talking about millions and millions of rows of transactions and possible items take grocery store or take Amazon as two, two examples or take Netflix where movies would be the items there um, would be in the hundreds and thousands of possible items so the, all the possible different items that a, a transaction can contain you can just you can just conceive in your mind is, is very very large okay um, so this uh, this definitely qualifies for what what's uh, the popular buzzword these days big data okay so it's an unsupervised learning technique that is readily used or, or, or is useful when dealing with transactional data which it tends to be quote unquote big data okay so it's got all the buzzwords in there and it seems like something that would be interesting for uh, a lot of people and easy to relate to. Basically, to put it in a nutshell, what we're going to do by applying association rules to market basket analysis in this grocery store is to try to find interesting relationships between items in this store. For example, I'll throw one out there, something that we could all relate to. You would expect if a customer were to purchase peanut butter and jelly that that customer might be very likely or highly likely to also purchase bread okay so that is one example of an association rule that might come out of uh, our analysis here and so basically we want to come up with all different kinds of these rules that are that represent likely behavior of customers in the in these in this uh, grocery store and uh, look at those rules at the end and reflect on them and see if there's any interesting um, relationships and patterns that we've learned that that are actionable so from a management standpoint um, you would be able to you know re reorganize things on in your store or reorganize your website or the way th the way you recommend items for example Netflix sees that you've watched so-and-so movies so it also recommends that you might like this movie okay so whether it's online or in store you could see that the rules that come out of this the patterns that we learn uh, might be actionable and useful to various different parties okay so now let's get a little bit more into the actual data here so here we see this data does not follow our traditional uh, columns and rows approach Although the rows here each do represent a unique transaction, so they're like our examples from our previous techniques, the columns don't line up, right? So citrus fruit is the first, would be in the first column of this first row, but then once you get to the second um, transaction, the second row, is it's tropical fruit. And furthermore, there's four columns in the first row, two, co three columns in the second row, one column in the third, four in the fourth, maybe five in the fifth. And so, so the number of features uh, or columns varies from row to row, from example to example, from transaction to transaction. So this is unstructured. We need to introduce some structure to this. Okay, so it would be uh, maybe smart to come up with something maybe conceptually looks like this we'll, we'll kind of make it fit into a matrix column and row format so this is our traditional structured data format we're used to seeing in relational databases and in spreadsheets where we have our examples on the rows right records, observations, cases, depending on what field you're coming from, and we have our features on the columns, right? Variables, attributes, again, depending on what field you're coming from, fields, right? So we, if we could kind of make it fit into this format, uh, it would be much easier for us to deal with. We'll give it some structure, in other words. So this is the way we're gonna 
roughly the, what we're going to do in the, in the ensuing steps. We're going to keep the transactions one a row. So when I say one here, this is transaction number one. Okay. The columns is where we need to introduce a lot more structure because it's lacking. So we're going to list out all the possible items that are in this grocery store. It just so happens that this grocery store had 169 items, which is not a terrible, not terribly a lot, but um, still much more than um, much more col that would result in much more columns than we're used to seeing. So we would put every possible item, we would give every possible item a its own field. So item one, item two. So this could be like milk, bread and so on and so on. So we would just do this until we've exhausted all the possible items in the particular store, web, or in a physical location. And then what we would do is we would mark off, so here's transaction one, here's transaction two, and let me just say three, four, and so on and so on. We'll mark off a one if that item was part of that transaction and a zero if that item wasn't included in that transaction. So what we're going to end up with is a bunch of a big matrix, a giant matrix. In this little example we're going to do it's going to be almost 10,000 transactions by 170 items. So that's 10,000 times 170. That's that's a, almost 2 million individual cells. And this matrix is going to just be filled by a bunch of ones and zeros. One if that item was in that transaction and zero if it wasn't. If you think about this carefully, you're going to, you're going to realize that most of this matrix is going to be zeros or empty cells. Okay? Because as we saw from as we saw from the transactional data that we uh, from the actual data out of 170 items, the first few transactions had between one and five items. So most of these rows are going to have zeros and with just a few ones scattered throughout. So the matrix will be sparse. And the word sparse also means to be thinly spread out. Okay, so we're going to make what's called a sparse matrix. And a sparse matrix will solve a number of problems in one go. So a sparse matrix like the one we were just talking about will not only give some structure to our very unstructured data, but it will also save us a lot of memory. Okay, As we're talking here big with big data, memory becomes an issue and we need a kind of efficient way to store this data and this matrix that I just painted for you here was giant even in this tiny example it had two million cells if I if each one of those cells has some kind of information in it a one or a zero a yes or a no uh, that will take up a lot of memory especially as this example gets more realistic and we have scenarios where we have thousands of items and millions of transactions Mem memory is going to become a huge issue so we need to be as efficient as possible so not only will a sparse matrix give us this structure which kind of we can uh, we walk through and it makes sense it, uh, for someone looking at that matrix, what it's trying to tell us. A, a, a sparse matrix will actually not record the zeros uh, where there's no um, item for that transaction. <clears throat> it'll actually keep them empty. <clears throat> so it'll keep them empty. By keeping them empty, it will uh, be much more memory efficient than a traditional data frame, which is how we're used to looking at data especially in R and other packages, uh, other software, um, statistical softwares. It won't record that information. It'll just keep that. It'll, it has a special way of 
just realizing that those cells are empty and so saves a lot of memory rather than making this actual matrix with, z uh, with all these zeros in it, okay? So a sparse matrix will be memory efficient uh, and will give some structure to our very unstructured transactional data, okay? So how to do this? Well, we have the data set, we have to read it in. So uh, traditionally what we've done is we've worked with either comma separated, tab separated, or some form of structured kind of data, data that was sitting on some kind of, in some kind of external file. <clears throat> if we were to actually record this, uh, import this as a CSV file, it wouldn't, we probably wouldn't get an error. Um, the reason for this is because there, the data was actually tab separated. I mean, just, I mean, comma separated, just look at these commas. So there is a tiny bit of kind of separation and structure here. Problem was the number of columns didn't all add up in all these rows. So if I were to do this, R would try to kind of fit everything in to the, the, the matrix row, uh, row and column format. And we would get the data, but it would just be a hodgepodge. Uh, everything would get mixed up uh, after the first few rows. Okay, so there is this package that, that is great for dealing with not only this type of transactional data, um, but also with the techniques that we're going to use later, and that package is called A rules. So what you want to do at this point is install this package. Okay, so install dot packages. A rules. Pick a mirror. Let it install. Once it's installed, you could pause this. Okay, require it. So load up all the load up the package, all its techniques and functions into the current environment <clears throat> now we can one of the first things we want to use is this nifty functionality called read transactions so it knows about this type of data it knows how transaction data is typically recorded and the varying lengths of each transaction it knows how to handle that so I personally have this data in groceries Okay, this is a data set that I will direct you in the comments section, in the um, information section of under this video on where you might be able to find this data set. Okay, um, for those of you who are taking a course with me, you have this data set. For those of you who um, perhaps are just trying to learn this on your own, try this data package. <clears throat> a rules. Once you've installed the package, uh, some packages have their own data sets. And this one indeed has this data set that I'm going to use. Now, this one might be slightly different than the one I have made available to my students um, external to R, but you can use this. All right. So you. In order to load this, you would just say data groceries, right? Be careful, it's a capital G, all right? I have my data sitting externally, uh, so I'm going to read it in as groceries. Okay, and if you like, I'll capitalize gross, okay? <laughs> read dot transactions, okay? And my data is sitting in a CSV file. Okay, and it's separated, comma, not, not a terrible idea to make that explicit. Let's read it in. Great, no error messages. If you actually type gross here and see, yeah, you, you, it won't just spew out all the data uh, like you're used to seeing with a data frame. It'll just give you this little piece of information. It's a transactions in a sparse format. We know what that means roughly now with that many transactions, so rows, and that many items, columns. Perfect. We are completely familiar with this, with that little explanation I did earlier. Okay, we've given this data some structure. 
if you were to try to do SDR here, it'll get ugly. Okay, so go ahead and try. I don't want to. It'll just flood your page with a lot. There's a lot of neat details in the structure of this data. But one great way to actually look at this data is to just do a summary and go through some of these details. I've tried to make my font big so you can see this. So I can't get this all on one page. So summary gives us some interesting. So this is a summary of these our sparse matrix that we created, our sparse grocery transaction matrix. So let's go through some of these because these are some good information. So transactions as what's called an item matrix, and you can see why it's called an item matrix, okay, in a sparse format. That many rows, that many columns. <clears throat> the rows are transactions, item sets, elements, however you want to think of it. So, and the columns are items. Density, density is interesting. Density is the total number of non-empty cells in that matrix, in that sparse item matrix. In other words, the total number of items that were purchased out of divided by the total number of possible items in that matrix. Uh, so basically, how many of those cells in that matrix are not empty? Okay, so remember where I was putting zeros, and then I told you that the sparse matrix actually is even cleverer than that. It'll even leave out the zeros. It, 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 it has a way of re just leaving things empty. So it's going to count how many of these cells have non-empty values in them divided by the total number of cells. So here, if it's 9,835 rows and times 169 columns, that'll be our denominator, right? Let me put it here. And then our numerator is how many of those cells actually have values in them, okay? So how many items were actually purchased? So what we could do is, let's do that calculation, times 169. Those are the, those are the total number of cells in that matrix, almost 1.7 million, OK? Let's multiply that by the density, so by this guy. So 0 0.02609. And we see that of the roughly 1.7 million cells in that sparse matrix, there are 43,365 roughly that have um, uh, that are not empty. Okay, so that's how many items were purchased. If you combine all the items that were purchased in all the transactions. Okay, so that's what density is. That's somewhat interesting. Okay. Then we get to this section, which is aptly named, most frequent items. Interesting. So it seems like whole milk was the most frequently purchased item in this grocery store. Second most, and it was purchased 2000, in 2,513 transactions. So that, that's quite a bit, uh, right? Uh, second most frequently purchased item was other vegetables, roll buns. Soda was purchased in 1,715 transactions out of the total of 9,835. Yogurt, and then everything else. So if you were to add up all these numbers, they should add up to 9,835. OK? Sorry, rather, they should add up to the 43,000. What uh, this number that we calculated here. This was the total number of items purchased in all transactions. So it, these guys should all add up to this guy. Okay. Okay. So that's interesting. More interesting that they then they add up is that what are the most frequently purchased items? Okay. So whole milk shows up clearly the most. Okay. Notice there's no brands in this grocery store, so that makes this a lot simpler. So we're just looking at whole milk, not the 10 different types of whole milk that we could possibly have uh, details for. Next section, elements. 
item set transactions length and distribution so these are the sizes of the transactions so this is how many transactions were for just one item that many how many transactions had two items in them that many all the way up to the trend the biggest transaction out of all 9835 transactions was for 32 items and it only happened one time okay so just pick any so how many transactions had 20 items exactly nine okay so that's how you read that that's interesting it shows how the uh, you know it shows you that most people are buying very few items right and it's quite rare for anyone to buy more than 20 items right that's that's represents a very small proportion right <clears throat> Next, we get some uh, summary stats, like the five number summary of the sizes. So the minimum was one. Obviously, we're not going to look at the transactions that have zero items. So the minimum transaction size was one. The maximum was 32. We already saw that. The median number of items was three. The mean was 4.4. These are interesting numbers to see. You see that definitely this is a right skewed distribution. Okay, that's cool. Okay, and the first quartile, sorry, the third quartile and the first quartile also are interesting. So that says 50% of, roughly 50% of the transactions had between two and six items. Okay, and only 25% of transactions had six or more items. Okay. All right, that's interesting. Okay, so let's move on. One final section here, and this is just uh, giving us how the labels of the alphabetically organized. Basically, you could think of this as it alpha. It looked at all the possible items in this grocery store by scanning through all the transactions and then put them in alphabetical order. Seems like a natural thing to do. And so it's just telling us the first three items in that sparse matrix, which basically means along the first, uh, along the, the columns here. So abrasive cleaner would have been the first column here, artificial sweetener, baby cosmetics, and so on and so on to 169th item. So this is not terribly uh, um, informative, although it shows us that the right things have gotten to, into this um, matrix, that things worked out. Okay, so I'm going to stop at this point. We've imported the data. We talked about association rules. We talked about market basket analysis. And we've got the data. We're ready to kind of inspect it more and learn about it more. Um, so let me make a part two to continue from here.